Okay, so uh, I'm Jonas Lund and I'm a Swedish artist at the moment based between Amsterdam and Berlin and I make a lot of different things and a lot of them have this in common and this is like the old school classic graph to explain or demonstrate networked systems, different types of networks basically. So a lot of my work has this sort of as a central part of it. The other which was also mentioned is this classic which I use the triangle, the hierarchical power structures. So like one guy on the top decides the fate for the vast majority at the very bottom. So then you can rate yourself and see where you end up in this power dynamic, basically. So I try and make a lot of work that attempts to subvert or think about different power structures in a new way, let's say, or to kind of reclaim the power for myself. One of these things that I've been looking into quite a lot is the art world, because for me it was this uh, perfect example of a super hierarchical uh, system of power. Like the top 100 people control the faith of the vast majority, like really, and it's uh, driving like cultural values and influence and it, uh, like the turnover yearly on the art market is massive, you know, and in the cultural production. But because it's so hierarchical and because this is the sort of basis for what to determine what art is and what good art is, which is the Institutional Theory of Art by George Dickey, which is the art is whatever the art world says is art. So you have the institution, which is super hierarchical, like the 100 people on top, determining what's good and bad in the art world. So coming from a background of programming and uh, somehow trying to uh, make things online, this is like a perfect system to uh, play around with. Because it means that the sort of attack vectors, if you're a hacker, are very few people on the very top. And if you can sort of influence these people for yourself, you have a much greater chance of making a good career, right? I mean, this is kind of it, you know, like this is the power structure. This is like maybe hans Ulrich Obrist is on top, or maybe it's like Klaus Bissenbach, which is the, like he's now at MoCA in Los Angeles. So these are like the power guys, and then probably the artists, you're like at the very bottom, slaving away, working, being like, okay, every day go to the studio. Like you see, this is the power structure. But the first thing I did was, and this was in 2012, 2013, was to make like a comprehensive database of the whole art world by scraping these like five different websites, which is artfacts.net, artnet.net, mutualart.com, artseed.net, and eflux.com, which is somehow the authorities on a data-driven analysis of the art world, let's say. I think artfacts.net is my favorite. It's artist ranking. So basically you have artist ranking based on exhibition history. So you get a list of 450,000 artists in descending order. And number one is Andy Warhol. And number two is Pablo Picasso. So, you know, like this is the challenge for anyone's artist career should be to get into the 250 top artists. Currently, my artifacts rank is like 2,100 something. So it's like slowly there. You know? <laughs> but uh, I befriended the CEO. So that, but that's another story. The players on the top, you know, artists, institutions, galleries, curators, auction results, exhibitions and critics. You can get all the data from these websites. You scrape it, download it, make a database. Well, big data database, it had a lot of data. And then on this, you add like this magic black box, the algorithm and out comes art. And it's like, how did it work? So this is from 2013. It's called the top 100 highest ranked curators in the world. So like then with, when you have the data, you can make a ranking algorithm of curators. And then you get to see who are the most important curators in the world. Not based on editorial decision, but based on the data. So it's seemingly objective. So this is like a who you should know, who's who in the art world, like a Facebook of the faces you should recognize at the opening and things like this. First one is like Francesco Bonami who curated Venice, second is Jan Hut, and then Hans Ulrich Ubers is on fourth, and it's mostly Venice biannual curators. Because that's seemingly the most important exhibition in the world for increasing your rank and your, like, your position. So this was one of the first outcomes of the database. Later I wrote another algorithm, not for analysis, but rather to, to create instructions for how to make successful works of art. Based on a sort of fussy logic of saying that um, 
complexity. I was rating artworks in this database based on complexity. And my algorithm, internal algorithm for ranking complexity was that it needed to have low production costs and high monetary value. Which is something, if taking two examples like the shark by Damien Hirst, is very high complexity because it's very expensive to make. So this one is like out of limits. And uh, Eve Klein blue monochrome will be like low complexity because it's just a monochrome. But I gotta say the monochrome has been done a lot. So I never touched the monochrome. It's not true, but yeah. So basically the algorithm analyzed all these things and then outputs instructions for how to make successful works of art. For an exhibition in Rotterdam at Showroom Mama called The Fear of Missing Out. The fear of missing out because you're scared of missing out of not being one step ahead of everybody else. And then with the algorithm, you can, I can put myself in a position of having an advantage over anyone else. So it's somehow a way to, you know, use the data to, yeah, get ahead, to try and find like a, a hijack of the system to say, okay, I can do this. Uh, and then I can sort of know where the trends are going before they're there. You know? So it produced instructions, which includes the title material, dimensions, color spectrum, and location in the exhibition space. So this is a crashed motorcycle. It's called Trust to be your luck 221. And it's just a single channel generative video installation. Uh, ping pong table behind non-reflective glass. It's called Black Sunday Satire. Uh, facial mask product on canvas stool, like Door the Kings. Steve Ballmer, a fridge and six crates of beer. Here the title and the material and the installation is all the same. So that was quite practical. And this is a shield Whitechapel isn't scoop. Acrylic and silk screen ink on custom rope. Cheerfully hat Sander Selfish is coconut soap, uh, seven minute, 50 second video loop. So it's like the video is inside the coconut soup with some epoxy. And then here is actually a monochrome painting. So I was kind of lying before. It's a, called Description Albert. And here's a parachute faces diptych airways. On the print it says the NSA hasn't been here yet. Watch closely for the removal of the sign, which was inspired by this public library in Chicago who was banned, who was blocked by the FBI to, they couldn't disclose if the FBI had audited their records, but they could not not disclose. So if you pay attention to the sign, if the sign was removed, they have not not told the public that the FBI had been there. It's clever, clever, very clever little hijack. And this is a concrete plexiglass and plaster. It's called Horizon Birth Grayish Blue. This was a disaster to make. It's like 250 kilos of concrete. Untitled petrified wood, light emitting diodes. So it's a kind of notion of uh, a lot of different things that goes into this work is to think about the formula for how you make successful works of art. Can I create such a formula to find like this perfect uh, solution to the problem of abstraction? Right? So how do you quantify it? What do you measure? Is it possible to measure these things? And is the whole ideolo ideology of measuring and quantifying these things actually what you want or not? So it's kind of... Um, exploration of the, the algorithm as the black box solution for any data-driven decision-making process you could ever imagine. You know? Because whatever you feed it, uh, you can get the results you want somehow. And then in the end, the art ends up, the algorithm produces the art that's then fed back into the sources that I scraped to produce the perfect cybernetic feedback loop. So then next time I do it, the works just keep on influencing and influencing. And then you get to this like uh, really great moment. This is a Demoing a beautiful product. Wow, this is a This is a This is a This is a It's magic. It was a magnifying glass available for $10. It's a modern solution to modern problem, I think. I'm going to talk about a couple of different works that somehow stand as the examples of my practice. I think this is a good example too because it's similar type of uh, subversion of a certain system. Um, it's paintings. There's 40 paintings. The exhibition was called Flip City. And he was somehow exploring or uh, 
going for exploring a certain aspect of the art world where flipping was a behavior that came up around 2013, 2014, and kind of ended in 2015 where collectors would buy works in bulk from very young artists and then resell them and resell them quickly to their friends, manipulate the market price to then make tons of money. So it's kind of a predatory behavior and Los Angeles was a very particular city for this purpose. And most of these paintings came from very young artists, around 20 something, and they were described as zombie, zombie formalism. So it's like formalism, abstract expressionism that just looks all the same, basically. And there was a couple of people who were very uh, central in this behavior. And it was pretty predatory and quite damaging for a lot of artists' careers because it's again like the powerful people on top are sort of exploiting the lowest, uh, the lowest in the hierarchy because you approach students at art schools and you buy like 30, 40 paintings for $100, $200 each. And through manipulation, you drive up the price to like $100,000, $150,000 over two, three years. And then you go like, whoa. So then like in my way, it's the sort of core of my work. It's to bite, to like have the cake and eat it too. This is like all the sort of desires in my artistic practice to uh, critique, but to profit, right? So like cri profit critique, maybe. Performance art capitalism. So these paintings, were 40 paintings, optimized based on auction results as collages of a lot of different paintings from these young artists. And then in the end, on the back, there's a GPS tracker that somehow uh, operates by a SIM card. So every day it sends a message to my server and tells me where it is. And then this is then shared onto a website called flipcity.net where you can see the whereabouts where they are all over the place. So then I have found a way to inject a sort of Trojan horse painting into the homes of the collectors who do these behaviors. So then you can show up at their door and say like, or hang out in the cafe nearby and be like, oh, you're here. So, oh, fantastic. You know, like the more information you have, the better. And then at the same time, it only works if the paintings sell to these collectors, right? So you, in a way I profit and critique and I can also then get more data, right? So it's, here you can see the location history of the Flip City 34. It goes from LA to Mexico to Bogota and then ends up in El Segundo, which I think is I think it's in Texas or maybe New Mexico. This is very good. It's like uh, Chinese arm wrestling. So good. So you break the hand and then when the camera on your hand sees the QR code, you pay him money on WeChat. It's fantastic little, how do you incentivize arm wrestling, right? So Trojan horses paintings, right? But then with the goal of them being sold and resold to increase the value, to like increase my career to make me better. These are like the abstractions. So then when they end up in auction, I go like, yes. And I become super happy because I'm like so naive. I don't understand that it's bad to have your paintings in auction if you're a young artist. Because that means that the collector who bought it doesn't want it anymore. So then it should decrease in value. So it only works if you have like a, a crew, like a, a set of people, you know, like your entourage that can just drive up the prices. So it's like the sentiment of manipulation on like 100%. So like, it's not good, you know? And then I only realized that too late, so. Which was interesting too, so then maybe it wasn't having the cake and eating it too. Like you get some consequences of these like subversions. But when this you is a voice and give people power, the system usually ends up in a really good place. That's Mark Zuckerberg from 2013 saying, if you give everybody a voice and power, the world usually ends up in a good place which I really don't think he knew what he was saying when he said it, but you know, it's like the intersection for the next work. So like shortly thereafter, when I now learned everything I did from the Flip City, I understood a bit better the dynamic between collector, uh, gallerist and artist. So then the next show was 24 paintings with uh, rules written on top of them, like by a sign painter that determine who can buy them and when and what they have to do or what they can't do. 
and the exhibition was called Strings Attached. So there's like, you got to re read the fine print in a way, you know, like in the contract. So for example, this one, this painting may only be sold to the following collectors, uh, Sabludovich, Simon de Puy, Beth Rudy de Woody, and Alain Cervais. Or this painting may only be purchased by a collector who agrees to purchase two more works by the artist before March 21st, 2017. <laughs> Uh, or this painting may only be purchased by a collector who also agrees to purchase donation, which is the painting to the right. And this painting may only be purchased by a collector who will donate it to one of the following museums by March 21st, 2020. And it's Modana, MoMA, Tate, Hamburger Bahnhof, Lachmann, Stedelijk. So, you know, this is a common practice within gallery, gallery business that you have a client who wants to buy work and you don't let him until he buys another work first. Or you let him buy two works, but he has to donate one to an exhibition or she has to do something else. It's like, you know, manipulation. It's like power abuse, you know, like this Jenny Holzer quote, it's like forever always true, like the, power, the abuse of power comes as no surprise. It's like if you have the power, you control, right? So what I understood between this dynamic of the gallery artist collector is that the artist is the one, until you're like really top, top, top artist, you're the one with the least amount of power. But then through d dictating what the painting may or may not do on the front of the canvas, the gallery, gallerist has no choice but to follow them. Because the artist has the ultimate power in one sense, and they can de-authenticate any artwork at any time. You just like take the certificate of authenticity and go like, it's not my art anymore. So this work comes with a website called stringsattached.info where you can check the the valid status of each painting. Right? So this painting may only be sold to a Golden Globe winner. And here's uh, cell phones with projectors on. How cool is this? It's like, if you don't get hit by a car in two minutes, I don't know. So cool. It's like, let's watch it again. It's like cell phones with built-in projectors. I mean, it's insane. So yeah, I mean, you know, that's a disaster. I don't know if it's a problem or a solution, or maybe it's both, you know, at the same time. It's great. So moving on to more recent work, uh, power. Yeah, you know, it's all about power in the end. Uh, I'm supposed to be talking about algorithms too, but I think it's all about power. I think that's the whole point, you know, because the one who writes the algorithm determines what the result is. Right? So like the algorithm, the black box is actually programmed by people and they program their bias and their uh, subjectivity into it. You know? And I think we mostly know this by now. Yes, okay, good. So this is an uh, artwork that started last year, which is a uh, Jonas Rund token which is a cryptocurrency that functions as voting shares in my artistic practice. As it says here, it's like, become a shareholder with agency over future decisions concerning Jonas Lund's artistic practice. And here it's like, every work comes with a terms of ownership. The Flip City has terms of ownership stamped on the back. It's like the terms of service of this exhibition, the terms of ownership, what you have to do for... This, by the way, you all agreed to, yeah. Which is good, yeah. Yeah, it's great. So I will take you to court if you don't follow. Uh, everything has rules. I like rules a lot because in the world of abstraction, rules seems very safe, you know? It's something to like hang on to. Because if you look at a painting and you don't get it, but you have a text on the wall, you'll be like, ah, oh, that feels good because I can understand text, you know? Just a little side note. So. Everything is explained about the Jonas Lund token in the terms of ownership. It's like 26 paragraphs. It's like, it's a cryptocurrency based on Ethereum, our ERC20 token standard, with a fixed amount of 100,000 tokens. 10,000 are initially distributed by the artist to form the board of trustees, like by invitation. 80,000 will be, will be distributed in three separate phases. Uh, during the first phase, 25,000 will be available to a JLT artwork, and then it goes on. So there's a bunch of different distribution phases. I think paragraph nine is the most interesting for me right now, which is 5,000 JLTs are reserved for the JLT bounty program, which is very common among cryptocurrencies and initial coin offerings and stuff. 
So you have a bounty. So you do something for me, I reward you with tokens. Like you invite Jonas Lund to a solo exhibition, you can get rewarded up to a thousand tokens. All you gotta do is file a claim um, on the jlt.ltd website, or you invite Jonas Lund to give a talk, you can get up to 200 tokens. Uh, you know. So, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back, you know. Which I spent maybe too long in Brazil for like, you know, learning how to do these things. <laughs> so it comes in many different shapes and forms, you know. Here's like a banner, invest in Jonas Lund. It has a bird. No one really knows what the bird is about, but it's there. I think, I thought it was a peacock, but I think actually it's a goose or a turkey. But it's like looking behind his back. He's protecting the terms of ownership you know? and looking to <laughs> Jonas Lund as the goal. And then this is the sort of icon of the token. This is at an exhibition in Berlin at the moment at Kindle. So this is the kind of uh, most obscene corporate branding you can imagine. And the token itself, the shape is the actual whole is the token. You know? So the other thing is just the blank mat. You know? It also comes in these shapes, which is like uh, wall pieces that each have X amount of tokens attached to them. And the price is determined by the amount of tokens. And the compositions are voted on by the board. So the board decides what they should look like. It's all kind of like very logical. You have to add a bit more abstraction to it for it to be like, I don't get it. But this is too, you understand it too well. Right? And this was in Art Düsseldorf. It's in, at an art fair with a booth with nothing for sale which is fantastic, which they wanted to give it the, the jury for best booth in the art fair and spent like two hours at the booth and they had a big argument and they'd be like, I mean, we would really like to give it to this booth, but we can't because there's no art in the booth <laughs> because they didn't get it, you know? So like the wallpaper was the art. And then, yeah, you got a certificate if you bought tokens. So here's like the close up details of the things. And then they also come in these shapes and forms. It's uh, developed, it emerges, you know, because it's based on the decisions of the board, the style and the visuals move and fluctuate, and a lot of different things are tested and tried out. Here's a sneak peek of the interface, just because why not, uh, where you can see different types of proposals, how many people vote and stuff. So I got invited to give an artist talk at Resonate last year, and the board voted to do it. Uh, where I really did not want to do it because I had heard also some rumors, um, rumors about them not paying the former speakers, etc. So I used this as an excuse to not go with the argument that the board did not know this information because there's no way they would have voted for going if you knew these things. Right? And that was just unmasking. Here's the uh, you know, some token bounties. So like host a Jonas Lund solo exhibition at an institution can give you up to 2,000 tokens. And then include a work by Jonas Lund in a group show, et cetera. It has many different sort of incentives for participation. It's, again, power structure. So they also uh, like decided things for this exhibition. Uh, so the, here's like, later on I also created a private Instagram account for only for token holders and they get to quickly decide, vote for things that aren't directly concerning the Jonas Lund token body of work, whether, for this exhibition, whether the pieces should be leaning or hanging. Right? Because initially I thought they looked really good when they were like leaning, but then the board voted for, uh, yeah, they voted for hanging, yeah. So then the board gets their will, right? And then the incentives uh, increase. So I think, uh, you know how your phone, yeah, your phone counts how many steps you take every day? This is a machine to fix that problem. Yeah. I mean, it has a very dark twist to it, you know, because in China you get incentives to, you get discount on your health insurance if you walk a lot. So then you put your phone like this with the app they give you, and then you get a lot of discount. I mean, it's like, this is a problem and a solution in one. No? I love this thing. If it wasn't so practical, it's like the greatest sculpture ever. Right? I mean, now we're talking about this show. I think most of it's clear already, but here's like the terms of service. We're all familiar with terms of service, you know, the thing you agree to, 
when you go and use Google and Facebook and Amazon or whatever, it's just like a bunch of rules and regulations that you have no real agency over. It's either take all of them or take nothing. And I know South Park did some episodes on this, which had some horrific consequences. And it's funny, it's a funny way to play with the rules of saying, okay, you've all agreed to all of these things now, right? Obviously, in this case, there's no real consequences if you don't follow it, maybe. But it's kind of a way to, yeah, it's there. For every time it's installed, it gets slanted by one degree more. So in the end, maybe after 90 exhibitions, it's just going to be like a whole line around the gallery. We shall see how it happens. This is a pattern from Alexa to help you out when you're having a cold. I just thought it was pretty good. So, Alexa, I'm hungry. <clears throat> she coughs. Would you like a recipe for chicken soup? No, thanks. Okay, I can find something else. By the way, would you like to order cough drops with one hour delivery? That would be awesome. Thanks for asking. No problem. I email you order confirmation. Feel better. It's really problematic, I think. Problematic, I think, would be the best way to, to talk about it. It's like, uh, I mean, it's one fraction of a million different patterns going around for determining the flow of things. I think if you think of algorithms as decision trees is the best way to think about it. Like you start somewhere and then it goes like yes, no, yes, no, navigate, like this sort of... I think in a way, like right now, you know, like Facebook's, yeah, it's funny. Uh, Facebook's edge rank algorithm, you know, that was formerly an algorithm, now it's like it still is, but then based on machine learning, it takes into account up to like 100,000 different signals. So 100,000 different parameters it looks at to determine what shows up in your feed or not. You know, 100,000. All of the incentives for what shows up is just to keep engagement high because that means more money through ad sales. You know? It's like the consequence of the ad-driven web. It's pretty depressing. All of it is totally depressing. So I, in this case, it's like a patent from Sony to trigger game interactions based on emotional response. So it's like a user ID, emotion, laugh detected, smile detected. Okay, trigger, you know? trigger. Oh, here's like a patent from Facebook. Uh, detects your emotion when you share a picture. Just like... Uh, not very much in the open, it would just like use your camera, maybe without your explicit consent, and then just like, oh, okay, let's tag this with like happiness. Because you know? what's a happiness index? You know? And current technology for determining emotions is a bit ridiculous. I think in terms of, it's still based on some old school research paper from the late 90s of like, because you can only detect six different base human emotions, just like fear, anger, happiness, surprise, disgust, and neutral. It's like, you know, so of those two, like two are maybe positive. It's like surprise and happiness. The rest is like bad. And then supposedly disgust is the most defining human emotion there is because no other animal experiences disgust. I'm not sure. Like I made, I selected one video per index to demonstrate what it is about, to explain how the algorithm functions. I think maybe it works. So this is the Jonas Lund Productivity Index. It's like a Chinese bikes, you know, on stacks. It's a bit hard to see maybe. So basically it's just a graveyard of bike sharing bikes. So the productivity is very high. Here's like the Jonas Lund Attention Index. It's that Chinese click like a click farm in China to just watch all the same videos to just increase uh, attention, to increase the happiness feeling you get from more likes, you know, as the dopamine trigger functions. I think this one is possibly the most disturbing of everything. This is like a. <laughs> Yeah. 
I mean, it's the Jonas Learn Happiness Index. It's a machine that detects what food you picked, detects your face, and then automatically pays with your face. Right? So the latest type of technology is like you pay with your face. The thing you can't escape ever. You can imagine if you give this data to, I mean, it's for sure coming to the Western world soon because this is like the latest high-end facial recognition software in China, which is everywhere. You know? Like this is, again, like the trust index where you go to school and you can no longer skip school because it detects your attendance through your face. So it's like students get added to the list. It's like pretty dystopian, I gotta say. You know, it's like not pretty dystopian, it's like utter dystopian. So, I mean, I can go on and talk, but this is actually my last slide and it's been 88 slides. I think in a way, the algorithms that power the different indexes are at the moment pretty proprietary, which is like the default, you know, like you see you get a number and what does the number represent and what does it mean in terms of this endless quantification, you know, like just measure, measure, measure. All the consequences of data driven decision making processes for society and like the political political landscape is somehow based on this number, the index that just quantifies something based on completely opaque and abstract notions of what it means. There's a national happiness index and they look on a huge variety of things, but most of it is based on user filling in information by themselves, which is like, as everybody knows, it's not a good way to get the truth. And I think Denmark always comes first, so probably they're the most smug about it because they feel the most happy. But it doesn't mean they are the most happy. Trust index is used a lot in finance to, to like analyze different types of corporations, so like how trustworthy are they. Attention index, attention index is like the heart of the attention economy, which is the, just the shitty result of an ad-driven web because everybody likes to get likes and that's good for engagement, so it's supposedly good for you, but it's terrible. You know? Productivity is the only thing that's the most honest, but then again, the consequences of this endless lifestyle of working, 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 and how this is somehow idealized as the best thing to do, especially in Silicon Valley, or I saw some videos today in China with like the WeChat office on a Sunday at 11 o'clock in the evening, all the lights are still on, because everybody's still working. It's shit, really it's shit. Productivity should be zero, that's actually a good thing. You know? So I don't know, they all come with their somehow biases, but I think the abstraction of it, because it's so specific, this show, I'm not, I don't wanna tell you much about how it works, because it's, you know, that's it. Any questions? Thank you.